Hello everyone. Hope you're having a great day today. Hey, today we're talking about interscholastic athletics and this is chapter seven. So interscholastic athletics is a segment within the sport industry that seems to draw the least amount of attention within the realm of sport management studies in academia. Scholars tend to focus their research toward collegiate and professional sport. Students enter the profession also tend to envision themselves as key players within the NCAA Division I athletic department, working in the front office of a professional sport team, or even working as an agent negotiating multi-million dollar contracts. The attention toward these segments is understandable, considering the dominant national media exposure of the professional and collegiate segments within the sport industry, provided by cable outlets such as Fox Sports and ESPN. At the lead story on SportsCenter dealt with a rift between the Bulldogs athletic director and head football coach, viewers might expect to see a story involving Mississippi State University, not DeSoto County High School in Florida. A story concerning the job security of the head coach of the Cowboys would draw attention to Dallas, not LaBelle High School in Hendry County, Florida. The many issues facing interscholastic administrators seldom draw widespread attention or interest. Although the national media may not cover high school athletics, this segment of the sport industry should not be overlooked in terms of growth, career opportunities, and economic impact. Lockhart and Wolf suggested that the employment opportunities within the sport and entertainment were expected to grow roughly 16% from 2010 to 2020, thereby exceeding the growth rate of many other occupations. A significant portion of that growth will occur in more than 24,000 athletic departments at the high school level in public and commercial sectors. As a business segment, interscholastic athletics contributes over 15 billion U.S. dollars to the sport industry in the United States. The potential influence interscholastic athletic administrators have over the lives of young adults can be significant. Over 7.8 million of the 15 million high school students, which is about 52%, who attended public schools during the fall of 2016 participated in athletics. As such, interscholastic administrators have a deep responsibility and obligation to meet a wide range of needs to their most important stakeholders the youth sport of America. For many kids, the way their school's athletic programs are managed and delivered will shape their perceptions about success and failure, organizational fairness, and other social norms. Although sport management professionals at both collegiate and professional levels are typically tasked with delivering a quality entertainment product for their fan base, Interscholastic athletic administrators play an important role in the educational and social de- development of the students who are involved with their students with their school's athletic program. High school athletics also play a role in the community by providing sport entertainment and serving as a prominent source of community well-being. The first intercollegiate athletic competition can be traced back to August 3rd, 1852 when Harvard and Yale matched their crew teams on the waters of Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. The details of the interscholastic athletic competition are less certain, but students from various public and private high schools in Massachusetts formed the Interscholastic Football Association in 1888. As such, it may well have been among those Boston area schools that the first interscholastic athletic competition occurred. At the turn of the century, interscholastic sport has become the largest sector in the entire sport enterprise. No other level of sport has as many participant sport teams or athletic programs as interscholastic sport does. In addition, each school and each state provides an array of sporting options to meet the interest of their students. Both traditional sports and niche sports are offered across the country. Individual state associations started developing and giving interscholastic athletics a more formal, formalized governance structure in the early 1900s. The associations developed broad and sport-specific standards, rules, and policies. The first state to establish a high school 
Athletic Association was Georgia, and 1904, the Georgia High School Association. During the early years when state associations were being established, colleges, university, non-school clubs, and promoters were organizing many interscholastic athletic competitions. As a result, little attention was given to the eligibility rules that were being established by the state high school athletic associations. In May 1920, after concerns were raised regarding the welfare of student athletes, representatives from Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, and Wisconsin met to discuss common concerns arising out of collegiate and non-school publicity of high school athletic contests. In 1921, the Midwest Federation of State High School Athletic Associations was created. The mission of the Federation was to protect the athletes. In recent years, there has been an increase in the offerings of school sporting opportunities for students with physical and intellectual disabilities, and many people think that we are at the precipice of a significant increase in school sport participation for people with disabilities. Current key initiatives are para-athletics and unified sports. The latter is a collaboration between school sport associations and Special Olympic associations. Attention has also been paid to gender equity policies, and there has recently been support for the inclusion of transgender students and school sports. In 1923, the name was changed to the National Federation of State High School Athletic Associations. By 1969, all 50 states and the District of Columbia had associations, and they were all members of the National Association. By the 1970s, selected fine arts activities were sanctioned by the National Federation, which thereby dropped athletic from its name entirely. Today, the National Federation of State High School, or NFHS associations, consists of 22 additional members, such as Bermuda, Guam, St. Croix, St. John, and St. Thomas. There are 10 provinces and three territories in Canada and seven affiliated associations for defense, forensics, and music. According to NFHS, three central premises indicate the value of offering interscholastic athletics or activities. Athlet the first is athletics support the academic mission of schools. Athletics are inherently educational and lastly, athletics foster success in later life. Many of the supporters of high school sport draw on these attributes to promote the importance of athletics and the educational mission of public athletics. Title IX of the Educational Amendments Act of 1972 was a landmark legislation that banned sex discrimination in public and private schools. The act covered in chapter the act is covered in chapters 8 and 17 applies to the activities of educational institutions that receive federal funding. At the time of its passage, fewer than 8% of the 3.9 million student athletes appearing participating in interscholastic athletics were girls. At the end of the 2016-2017 school year, girls accounted for 42.6% of the 7.9 high school million high school students playing sports. Some critics of the application of Title IX to sport have argued that to be compliant with the legislation, boys' sports were cut, thus diminishing opportunities for boys to participate in sport. That position may be disputable because, as indicated in Table 7.2, the number of boys participating in high school sport is at an all-time high at more than 4.5 million. The two leading states with regard to participation are Texas with 809,075 athletes or 10.3% of all the high school athletic participants in the United States and California 10.2%. Texas has the most boys participating in high school sports and California has the most girls. Rounding out the top 10 are New York with 372,772 athletes, Illinois 344,143 athletes, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, New Jersey, and Minnesota. 
One of the most challenging aspects of managing any organization is establishing an organizational structure that best fits the needs of the organization's employees, the teachers, coaches, officials, and administrators, and constituents, such as the parents, the students, and athletes. One student one significant consideration when structuring an athletic department is the size of the school district. Small districts or private schools, such as Newfound Area School District in New Hampshire, was serves seven cities and has approximately 1,400 students, one high school and two middle schools, or Storm Lake Community Schools in, Ohio, in Iowa, which has approximately 2,000 students, one high school and one middle school have a centralized organizational structure. The centralized structures tend to have vertical reporting relationships often characterized as a chain of command. You'll see that here in figure 7-1, which illustrates the difference between a centralized and a decentralized structure at the bottom. The AD may work at the high school and report to the high school principal while overseeing the athletic administrative duties for the entire district. The AD may also serve as a coach, a teacher, or even the high school principal. In a centralized structure there on the top, the AD typically hires all the district's coaches and has a campus coordinator at each middle school to oversee daily athletic administrative duties. This type of structure is most often used by private schools. For larger school districts such as the Miami-Dade County Public Schools, which has more than 345,000 students in over 100 high schools and middle schools, or the Houston Independent School District, which has more than 203,000 students in over 80 high schools and middle schools, a centralized athletic department would not be feasible or manageable. In these mega athletic programs, administrative responsibilities are often decentralized through a, a matrix management template. This type of structure allows dual reporting relationships. The district may have a district AD who, who coordinates athletic activities within the district, who has staff level authority in the schools and school-based ADs, who report directly to the school principals for implementing the district programs. These high school ADs would most likely supervise feeder school campus coordinators one or more assistant ADs and a business manager. Although athletic budgets may differ from school to school, the primary expenses tend to be similar. Most budgets have the following categories, such as salaries and benefits of your personnel, equipment, supplies, transportation, professional development of your people, awards and other miscellaneous costs. Typically, insurance and facility costs are held back at the district level for public schools. ADs at private schools or in smaller public school districts may also be responsible for facility expenditures. School budgets allocated to athletics vary greatly from 1% to 3% of operating budgets to as much as 8%. As operating costs continued to rise during the 2008-2009 school year, the economic downturn across the country had a detrimental effect on overall school funding and, in turn, on athletics. The primary source of funding for most school districts is through property tax assessments. Because the economy grew throughout the 1990s and into 2007, property values increased, providing additional revenue to school districts. In 2008, however, when the real estate market collapsed, many school districts and athletic departments found themselves with significant revenue shortfalls. The Miami-Dade School District, for example, reported an estimated operational deficit of more than 200 U.S. million dollars. As a result, spending cuts were required at all facets of the educational system, including athletics. ADs across the country were forced to adapt to the decline in revenue and stretch their budgets to meet the growing needs of student athletes. Numerous options were available to ADs, although some programs drastically re reduced the number of contests in which their athletes competed. Others eliminated sports completely, particularly in middle schools. Additional attempts to resolve funding concerns, including replacing some individual contests or matches with tournaments, implementing pay-to-play policies, reducing the frequency of uniform purchases, 
increasing fundraising activities, and seeking greater support from booster clubs. Athletic administrators also reduce transportation costs by restricting competition to schools and proximity to the home school, discontinuing courtesy bus service to transport parents to and from away events, and scheduling contests on the same nights for boys and girls teams or the varsity and junior varsity teams so teams could travel together. Unlike public schools, which derive most of their funding from district property taxes, private schools rely on dona donations, tuition allocations, or participation fees. When faced with budget issues, private schools can raise tuition or seek donations from companies or individuals. Because public schools tend to be public bureaucracies, ADs must operate with a rigid bureaucratic structure. Private schools tend to be leaner in their management structure, allowing greater flexibility in making decisions. Career opportunities in high school sport cover a wide array of disciplines at the grassroots level. The nature of these jobs requires professionals to work long and often irregular hours. Typically, practices and com competitive events occur outside the regularly school scheduled school day during the late afternoons, evenings, and weekends. Executive Director. This person serves as a CEO for an association. The CEO is accountable for the daily operations of the organization. This person supervises the staff, carries out the agenda of an organization's membership and officers, and oversees the organization's legal affairs and legislative interests. Chief Financial Officer or CFO is accountable for all financial transactions of the organization affiliated with Interscholastic Athletics. The financial transactions include business operations, payroll, and accounts payable. Besides overseeing the various transactions required, the CFO prepares all financial reports and the annual operating budget. Director of Media Relations and Marketing. The person who holds this position serves as the public liaison for the Interscholastic Athletic Organization. Besides maintaining a website, this person oversees sponsorships and other revenue generating ventures such as broadcasting rights, licensing, and purchasing, and director of membership services. These are professionals who hold this position to maintain the interscholastic requirements. Besides positions in coaching, officiating, or as athletic directors, people are needed for administrative support as coordinators at the middle school and junior high school levels and various associate AD positions to oversee facilities, transportation, event management, and business operations. Beyond the school district level, professionals play a large role in interscholastic sport governance and in the management of the various state athletic or activity associations and national professional associations. A brief list of full-time professional positions available in interscholastic athletes with their common job accountabilities follows. So, Athletic Director at AD serves as the school's Senior Administrator for Athletics. The primary function is to provide the leadership and management of the Interscholastic Athletic Program. In research that we have conducted, we found that ADs spend the greatest amount of their time, 39%, engaged in traditional managerial activities. The de they deal with human resource issues for 27% of their time. The balance of their time is spent engaged in either communication-based activities, which is about 24%, or networking, about 10%. The AD position calls for extensive levels of interaction with students, parents, coaches, faculty, and members of the community. Specific duties and responsibilities include preparing a master budget for capital expenditures and ongoing operations of each school-sponsored sport, ensuring that all sport programs operate within the guidelines, such as eligibility, established by the appropriate governing bodies and coordinate and schedule use of all athletic venues. They hire all coaches, officials, trainers, and athletic department support staff. Oversee, they also oversee the scheduling of all athletic events and provide oversight to athletic booster club activities and fundraising.
here we talk about issues that face interscholastic athletics. One of those is participation options. Although participation rates have consistently increased from year to year for boys and girls, the athletes' commitments to their school's athletic programs have become another challenge. More students are electing to compete on non-school athletic teams as well. By competing on a school-sponsored team and a non-school-sponsored team at the same time, athletes are faced with demands from two coaches. Students become torn between their commitments to both teams and some end up choosing to compete on the non-school sponsored team or club sport team. Um, the reason for this decision is that non-school programs such as those associated with AAU and Junior Olympics often have traveling teams and year-round competitions. Such opportunities entice athletes to choose their non-school athletic program over their school athletic program. Rather than forcing an athlete to choose representatives from both school and non-school programs should work together for student athletes' well-being. Many of the ugly, ugly issues appropriate apparent in college and professional sport are now appearing in high school gyms. Students and parents must be constantly reminded that competition is a game rather than a war. Fair play is as much a concern for fans as it is for athletes. Because fans and players view poor sport behavior on TV in collegiate and professional sport, enforcing fair play expectations at the prep, such as the high school level, has been extremely difficult. Teaching fair play through high school is needed. The NFHS is trying to combat poor sporting behavior issues through its program called Citizenship and Asset Building Through Athletics. Also, the NIAA offers specific courses on student-centered educational athletics and coach-centered educational athletics in its Certified Athletic Administrator Program curriculum. According to Mike Blackburn, Executive Director for the NIAA, handling parent issues has become very time-consuming for athletic administrators and coaches. The following are some of the issues. Grievances parents have towards school athletic programs and staff. A parent's lack of understanding of education-based athletics. Parents exerting improper influence with school administrators. And parents trying to be too involved in the program. Parents' beliefs that their children have greater abilities than they actually do. And parents' attitudes that participation in athletics is a right rather than a privilege. Parents conduct conduct toward coaches or toward officials. Future athletic administrators and coaches will need to devote resources and time to communicating and developing supportive relationships with parents as these concerns continue to surface within interscholastic athletic programs. In the end, it is paramount that parent, parents understand that athletics is not separate from education, but rather an integral part of their children's education. An area that continues to be a growing concern is the presence of the media in interscholastic sport. The marketplace is a fertile ground for media organizations to secure live content because rights fees to televise live high school contests are significantly less expensive than the media rights for many professional sport leagues and major collegiate sport offerings. The recent ruling between by the NCAA to ban school and conference owned networks such as the Sooner Sports TV or the SEC Network from showcasing high school games and events has arguably opened the door for other media conglomerates such as ESPN, U, or Fox Sports to acquire the rights to televise interscholastic sports. In fact, the opportunity to feature high school sports has caught the attention of the NFHS. The National High School Governing Body has a planned launch of an NFHS network such as enhancing school athletics digital presence and live streaming of games, which is projected to have revenue of $100 million per year approximately five years from the network's commencement date. And that was with Smith in 2013. While the NFHS will own a majority of the network, there are still unresolved issues such as revenue sharing among the organization's members, sport coverage beyond football and basketball, and whether girls sports will be afforded similar network coverage as boys sports, to name a few. Thus, the NFHS should work closely with each state's high school governing body 
to ensure the presence of an equitable and fair system that benefits all stakeholders. These issues challenge administrators to adapt to a constantly changing environment involving school policies and the school's governing sport. Each issue is often unique in the minds of the people involved, so the administrator must be consistent when dealing with them. Balancing the needs and interests of the student athletes and the educational mission of a high school often requires the athletic administrator to reach some form of compromise. If the decision is fair and ethical, all the affected stakeholders should be satisfied or at least willing to accept the decision. Maintaining fairness in the decision-making process and involving the associated parties with some degree of participation in the process and treating everyone with dignity and respect throughout the process will often result in acceptance of the decision. The following paragraphs present two issues that require critical thinking by athletic administrators. Proponents of high school sports stress the importance of athletics as an extension of the classroom learning experience. As covered early, earlier in this chapter, sport offers some unique benefits that are certainly laudable. For example, many argue that participation in sport builds character, teaches teamwork, and encourages fair play. Participants learn the rewards of hard work, self-discipline, and self-confidence. Participation often improves social adaptability. Students involved in extracurricular activities often have lower dropout rates, higher attendance rates, higher grade point averages, and fewer discipline problems in school. Furthermore, students engaged in extracurricular activities are often less likely to use drugs or become teen parents. Using the eight critical questions from chapter one, examine the arguments that athletics is an extension of the classroom learning experience, given the benefits offered by participation. Another critical thinking exercise could involve the monetary aspect of interscholastic athletes. For example, we noted earlier in the chapter that because of declining property values, many communities and school districts face revenue and budget shortfalls. Many schools have embraced outsourcing as a means of controlling their expenses. Typical services being provided by commercial sector companies include school transportation, food services, custodial services, and substitute teachers. Why not expand the services to athletics? Schools could outsource their athletic departments either to one company or to a variety of commercial club sports. Another option might be to provide vouchers so students could play. And here are just a few review questions. What are the major operational differences between public and private school athletic departments? What are some of the underlying factors that caused interscholastic sports to become a part of the educational system? And what are some of the ways the media, um, such as social media and sports broadcast, have affected interscholastic athletics? And what do you see are some future changes in terms of the media's influence at the high school level? So in summary, this chapter's provided an overview of interscholastic athletics, which is one of the largest but relatively understudied segments of the sport industry. From a human development and sociological perspective, high school athletics affects 50% of all high school students. As a segment of the sport industry, interscholastic athletics contributes billions of dollars to the U.S. economy and provides full-time and part-time jobs for more than half a million people. School-sponsored athletic programs shape or influence in some form the lives of more than 14 million people. That's students, family members, coaches, administrators in the United States. Although supporters and detractors may have differing views of the role that interscholastic athletics should play in the educational process, both would agree that athletics are tightly woven into the culture and society of the United States. And I thank you for joining me today. I look forward to talking with you soon. Have a great day.